Hello, Story Seekers. I'm Ben. I'm Nico, and you're listening to our favourite part of the week. Stories, discussions, and a high likelihood of gratuitous obscenities, all in the service of a bibliomancer. This is the Tiny Bookcase. Our guest for this episode is near and dear to our hearts, having been a recurring guest since season one and a university chum of mine. He is also the author of short stories and novels, most recently the Guy Fawkes Demon Hunter trilogy, which we were lucky enough to hear a snippet of on the bookcase in 2021. We would like to warmly welcome back Benjamin Langley. Hello, Benjamin. Hello, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back with you again. I mean, how does it feel to be our first third time guest? It's it's a real privilege. Yeah, (laughs) um, I feel under a bit of pressure to to write a short story. Um, Having not done so for a little while, getting back into it again has been, been great fun. When was your last uh, short story? Um, because I spent so long on the on the Guy Fawkes trilogy that that took up all of my time time for a for a very long time. So mm. I, I think I did write the odd short story for um, Open Calls, but I think it was a good year or so um, since I'd last written a, a short piece, and and a lot longer since I'd written anything this short. So, yeah, it was it was it was a lot of fun, but it did feel slightly weird. Slightly Don't weird. Know, I yeah. haven't smashed out any novels in that time, so <laughs> <laughs> total word count. You're well ahead. I, uh, yeah. I mean, even recently, we uh, Nico and I wrote a three thousand word short story for the bookcase in the last yeah. couple of episodes, and I felt I really felt the pinch when we went back to fifteen hundred words. It was almost yeah. immediate. So even inside a week or two, you can you can quite quickly adapt to whatever word length that you're working to. You're yes, just greedy can, for yeah. words, Ben. I am greedy for words. I often do push the envelope a little bit. <laughs> so uh, now that that's drawn to a conclusion, the Guy Fawkes stuff, have you got another historical figure ready to to rehistorize? That's not a word. <laughs> it works, I think. Um, not a, not a historical figure as such, but um, okay. While I'm my, while my head's in that era, um, I'm outlining something about the drainage of the fence, um, a story in which a family pray to God that this is not going to happen and ruin their livelihood, and when that doesn't work, they have to go somewhere darker. <laughs> oh, that sounds brilliant! Immediately. See, I, I read your last book about Fen. <laughs> yeah. So I'm already excited. <laughs> It's it's very much in the, the planning stage at the moment. There's no words down yet, so it might be a, a, a distance away, this one. Well, we might well try and milk you for some more details on that when we get to the interview. But I think it oh, might yeah. be story time. Well, I suppose so, gents. Our regular listeners know how it goes. But for those of you joining us for the first time, there will be three stories told in this episode. All of them have been written to the same shared prompt. And this week, that prompt is Marble. Ben, normal Ben, our Ben, <laughs> up first. Marble. I was unable to fathom where I was going and knew only that it was away from London. My father, a widower, was already beyond his limit, caring for a quiet boy who served only as a painful reminder of his late wife. He likely breathed a sigh of relief as the Nazis rained bombs on our city. In that crisis, he perhaps saw a kind of freedom, and in the simplicity of the conflict, there was no space for me. The trains left every nine minutes or so, and I nearly lost hold of his limp hand several times as he roughly ushered me into the throng of panicked people attempting to board. A small tag, written in my father's hand, dangled from a piece of twine which had been looped around my neck, and I remember knowing that that was important. After a flurry of activity, I found myself without him and wedged into a luggage rack with a trio of siblings, excitedly discussing where they were to be sent. They discarded any interest in me after they informed me my tag simply read, End of the Line, and I would therefore play no part in their future adventures. The train emptied as the day darkened. I must have slept, and when I awoke, the stillness of the carriage frightened me. Another strange thing on a day filled with change. 
I heard a call for the end of the line, and, not knowing what else to do, I got off the train. The short platform was lit by several lamps, and I watched as some men hauled a crate off the train a few doors down from me. A dour fellow, with the strands of what lank hair remained to him tucked behind his ear, seized me by the shoulder and grabbed at my tag. He made a clicking noise as he read it, and then began to push me towards a motor car, into which the crate was also loaded. When I asked him if it was he I was supposed to be staying with, he responded by opening his mouth wide. Within was the stub of a tongue, the rest of which had been removed. Terrified into silence, I went with him. The steady bouncing of the car set me adrift on the seas of sleep, and when I awoke, there was morning light on my face. Someone had dressed me in pyjamas that were not mine, but fitted well. The room about me was extravagant to the point of being meaningless, and I realised that it was the sound of a small bell that had summoned me from my slumber. With the incaution of a child, I rose from the bed and went in search of it. The great house I walked through would have been labyrinthine had I not been following the sound of the bell. I entered a long hall filled on either side by high windows, which seemed to make every surface in the room shine with the morning's radiance. Statuary lined the hall, and at the far end, a monstrously tall old man was craning over a block of white stone, which had been placed on a plinth. Next to him, the tongueless horror from the night before was ringing the bell and only stopped when he saw me. He held out his hand to the tall man, and I heard the jingle of heavy coins as the mute was paid for some service unknown to me. The mute left, taking the empty crate with him, and I looked up from his retreating back to stare at the tall old man. Marvellous, aren't they? The statement confused me, so I nodded. Marble. To the human perception it does not age. Time parts before it like the waters of a calm lake around the bow of a boat. The Greeks and the Romans often befouled it with paint, daubing on base colours as a slapper might before a night's work in a theatre back alley. I have a great love for unadorned marble. As he spoke, he appeared to climb down the back of the block of stone, disappeared for a moment, and then reappeared. I could see that he in fact was no taller than my father, but the strange intensity in his eyes spoke of a life spent learning all there was to know. How old are you? he asked while studying my face. Nine, sir. Fear brought out my manners. I understand your father claimed you to be only eight. And your name? Uh, George, sir. Well, George, you will come to this room every morning at six when you hear the bell. You are to remove your pyjamas and sit on that stool. I wish to capture your innocence and seal it in flawless stone. He indicated a stool that I had not noticed by one of the windows. Do you understand? I did not, but I nodded my head anyway. Do so now then, and we can begin. I do not recall any feeling of strangeness around the act. There was a quality to the space around the old man that made it feel liminal as though whatever rules or propriety might govern society did not necessarily apply there. Or perhaps I was too frightened from my adventures to consider saying no. I do remember how warm I felt sitting in the concentrated light of that window. I remember the steady rhythm of the hammer blows at the base of his chisel. And I remember the marble dust sparkling in the air as he delved into the white block to capture my likeness. I did not want for anything other than companionship in my time there, Meals were served regularly by a silent maid at the kitchen table, and the wardrobe in my bedroom proved to be full of boys' clothes, some of which fit me well and others which were too small. A week or so passed before my boredom began to supersede the mind-blanked state of abandonment I subsisted in. There was nothing for me to do in that grand old house beyond my morning commitments, and so I began to stray further and further into the grounds. Ponds, woods and glades fanned out from the manicured grass that surrounded the house like a moat. Greenery like nothing London had prepared me for completely engulfed the place. By the end of the Friday, on the second week, I had grown terribly homesick, and by chance I discovered the road. I did not think I knew why I ran that day, though now of course I have my suspicions. I simply started walking and followed the road all the way back to the station I had arrived at. I slipped onto the next train back to London, hiding in the rack for fear that a conductor might discover me. I need not have feared. 
only fools were returning to London, and so the train was mostly empty. I saw the chimneys first. They appeared like a stain on the horizon as I approached the city, and the belching grime of it gave me a trill of excitement at my homecoming. That feeling was squashed in short order as I tried to find my way home. Not only was my father's house gone, but so was the rest of the street. In its place was rubble out of which jutted broken timbers. Small curios, broken furniture and everyday knick-knacks, which had lived happily inside the houses, were sown through the mess like seeds, as though new lives might sprout from the ruins of the old. I was catatonic for a time, but soon found myself back on that blasted train. It transpired that the old man had made quite a fuss when I had not answered the morning bell, and had sent the mute groundskeeper to fetch me back, a task the man performed with great efficiency for another handful of coins. By late evening, I was back in that bedroom, and dreading the reprisal that would surely come in the morning. The long-awaited bell startled me, and I dutifully made my way quickly down to the long hall. The faces of the boys I would never know seemed to stare down at me in commiseration as I walked past them to my stool. The old man did not look at me until I had removed my pyjamas, and when he did, I was not prepared for the look of sorrow on his lined face. It is gone from you. I can see that clearly. You have ruined it. He pronounced the words carefully, as though holding back tears. He lay his tools on the plinth and left, never to say a word to me again. I saw out the next two months in the silence of that house before being returned to London, where I still reside to this day. During that time, I found the graves of the other boys in a small copse the groundskeeper kept well tended. The names, crudely scratched into the wooden crosses, matched those stitched into the collars of the clothes in my wardrobe. A small mound of disturbed earth marked where the mute had recently dug and then refilled a space in that secluded yard. Even then, I think I knew what the old man had taken from them, what he might have taken from me. Those poor unfortunates, their innocence captured, and their souls stolen by marble. Goodness me. I... Where was the uh, the magic wardrobe and all that stuff, man? I thought, yeah, it's a bit of a bit of a different direction. <laughs> that was uh, deeply melancholy, but in a not in like a oh, isn't this sad for me? But just almost emotionally numb. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it has a bit of survivor guilt potentially. Yeah, beautifully dark at the end there as well. Um, yeah, I. There were lots of clues in there about kind of the clothes not quite fitting. Clearly, they belonged to someone else before. Um, mm. I had kind of much more innocent ideas of this this old man just trying to recapture an image um, of someone he had lost, not trying to capture this essence of, of innocence, which was, yeah, marvellous. Um, the idea occurred to me um, a few weeks ago when I was I was on the train to London, and I just thought, we, you hear quite a lot of stories about evacuees and, uh, you know, during the Blitz and such. And you, obviously we know Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, but also there are, you know, you hear other tales of yeah. kids going off to families all over the place. And, and it just occurred to me that some of those people that they went to must have been assholes. Like, yeah. it, 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 they must have been bad people in, involved in that process. My, um... My grandfather, on my uh, on my dad's side, stayed with a um, a family who forced him to work their farm. Oh! And only fed him root vegetables the whole time he was there, and to this day will not eat root root vegetables because of it. <laughs> oh shit! Oh, I'm yeah. sorry to hear that. It's very like when I was a kid, and he tried to explain it to me. Like I'd recently seen Good Night, Mister Tom, and I was like, "What are you talking about, man?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I'm not really aware of any any stories of abuse that came out of that time, potentially yeah. because of the way that the country was sort of generally pulling together, um, or at least that's the, you know, um, that's sort the of notion they'd like to give. Yeah, that's the sort of national identity around that crisis, isn't it? You know, this, you know, all pulling together in the same direction to defend hearth and home and protect the children. Yeah, those that any any sinister stories would be 
buried pretty deep, wouldn't they, to, to maintain you'd, that? You'd have thought so. The, uh, the tongueless man was a fascinating character, by the way. Mm. Just, it's, I, I, I think it was how you captured him, but it had this this brilliant sense of him being like he probably actually wasn't like this mute horror show, but it's how his childhood memory of him is. Like that, yeah. that way that everything gets slightly distorted by time, and the monsters become more real and. Yeah, I think you know he obviously meets him for the first time on a on a fairly dark train station in the middle of nowhere, which, you know, you're not going to come off well if you if you're yeah. not well presented and you're missing your tongue in that scenario, especially if you insist on waggling the stub at a child. Yes, it's the word stub. I write that down. The stub of a tongue, that does give you a very it's vivid a... picture of that. Mm. See, it's, it's the waggle that gets me, Benjamin. I feel it's, like <laughs> it's always the waggle that gets you. You're a waggler, a born waggler. <laughs> hey. That's a cultural difference. Okay? <laughs> Just be grateful I didn't call this character a ragamuffin at any point. Otherwise, you'd have been fully at it. <laughs> um, no, I, I think with that character, I think I was trying to uh, get a bit of the opening of Great Expectations going. Okay, yeah, um, yeah, I see that. Just this, like, terrifying creature of the night. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, but yeah, I, 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 enjoy, I often enjoy these ones where you sort of you you use well I use a like a like a childhood memory as the, as the lens. Yeah. Um it's, I find it quite an interesting way of telling stories so enjoyed it. Yeah, I think I think you do do it very well as well. Like you're you're quite good at capturing that um especially like re- reflective youthfulness. Yeah. I think yeah. you do that particularly well. It's cuz I spend most of my day doing that I think in my <laughs> reflecting on your youth. Yeah. Oh dear. Time's gone by. Well, anyway, that's uh, that's quite enough of me in this, I think. Unless anybody else has got any nice or horrible things to say about it, I'll, I'll happily take either. I very much enjoyed how quick it moved into the story at first. We, the, the, we're we're travelling immediately, small details of the tag and the twine. We can kind of see this chaos as he gets on there. And then, then just the end of the line, just a phrase that, that has that literal meaning, but, but so many metaphorical meanings as well to, to tease that early on. It just opens up to lots of possibilities about what might happen here. So I thought it was a very effective lead into this. It's very kind of you. I think potentially one of the reasons why it moves along at such a clip is that um, when I when I plotted the story out, uh, I was very pleased with it. And when I started writing it, I realised that it was a 6,000 words short story. Uh, so I had to alter the structure considerably and still wanted to get as much of the good bits in as I could. Um, so potentially it, it, it suffers from a little bit of compression. Um, I think, but, um, yeah. you actually, you followed that principle of, of like letting parts of the story tell themselves though, like that, the familiar visual language that we're used to of the evacuee, you deployed very elegantly to, to like put us in the right setting. So mm-hmm. I think, I think like where you've had to compress, you've done it with the tools that we've, we've worked on and talked about before. So yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, that's the both both things are very kind, so I appreciate it. Thank you and very much, guys. And you're a wanker. There you go. Oh, thanks. <laughs> oh, oh good. Now I now I can come. <laughs> right. Ben, Ben, other Ben, not ejaculating Ben. Please rescue us from this mire by telling your story. I need a second to compose myself after that. <laughs> okay, um, here oh, goes. Not you as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one! That one really came from the back of my head. That one. I can only apologise. That's not where it's meant to come out. <laughs> oh, right. Okay, compose, compose. Right. Here we go. Um, marble. We all have one thing that messed us up in a major way. For some, it's an event. Others a place. Sometimes it's an object. Mine was a marble Grandad gave me when I was sick. And no, I don't think being close to my maternal grandfather made me special. It's typical, but you need to understand all the same that I worshipped him. Dad was busy with work, but Grandad had me in his garage handing him tools for building furniture and carving toys. 
with his shock of white hair, he was full of the wisdom you'd expect from a guy who looked about as old as the world itself for someone with only six years of perspective. Dad yelled when I messed up. I'll tell you, he was loud. Hacksaw on metal, loud. So when Grandad told me, we all make mistakes, and it's what we do after that matters, it felt profound. Grandad always steered me right. To a bloke like that, sitting watching a screen was sacrilege. So when I tried to show him Phoenix on my Atari 2600, he distracted me by reaching into his pocket and pulling out a marble. The marble, the size of an eyeball, milky white with little flecks of red like explosions of bloodshot. I put down the joystick, deaf to the eight-bit bleeps of swooping aliens, and gazed at that glass ball. I ran my thumb over the surface, finding a chip on one side. Come on, Grandad said, tempting me away from the console. We'll make a marble run. In every step of the process, as he bored holes through blocks of wood meant for the fire, and showed me how to cut the joints and carve in the grooves. Soon enough, he had this castle, a tower at one corner. He put the marble in the top, and it disappeared, emerging on a path that ran around the outside of the castle wall, before moving inside and dropping into the courtyard, beneath the portcullis and along a track. I must have dropped that marble into that tower a hundred times. That marble accompanied me everywhere all summer. I reached into my pocket and an explosion of possibilities hit me. Mum bought me more marbles and I created different courses out of bits of chipboard and blocks of wood. I raced them and Grandad's marble always won. It was bigger and collisions sent unworthy pretenders flying off course. My obsession brought the marble marble into nightly dreams of Grandad's house, where I drop the marble on the floor and watch it roll in different directions, always leading me to him, in the kitchen, in his shed, out into the garden. And when I found him, the dream faded away. I was back at school, but still in shorts with the marble in my pocket when Grandad took ill. I wanted to show him the marble run I'd spent weeks constructing, which stretched to the bottom of the garden, elevated at different heights on pallets. I wanted to give Grandad's marble a real test before he saw it. I traded two small yellow marbles and a penguin bar for the gleaming metallic marble, which was only a fraction smaller than Grandad's. I dropped all the marbles at the start of the course. That metallic monster sent some of the smaller ones flying and it was close to Grandad's marble when they reached the first curve. I'd love to tell you what happened next, but I didn't think to look down as I chased those marbles along the garden, and I tripped over a damned hosepipe. Dirty need and not without a little pain, the kind that usually brings tears, I got up and raced to the finish. Don't think those tears didn't come. They were delayed, that's all. Delayed until I looked into the pot at the end of the run and found Grandad's marble wasn't there. The metallic bastard sat in the bottom. I started searching right away, but Mum stood at the back door and called me in. We had to go to the hospital, she said, to see Grandad. I don't remember that visit, only the dream that followed. I dropped the marble. It rolled straight to the stairs that led down to Grandad's basement. It bounced down the steps, but when it hit the bottom, it disappeared. The basement was illuminated with flickering orange light from the furnace, which roared like the stomach of a starving man-eater. Grandad stood at a workbench, sawdust drifting around him. He turned to me, sadness painting his face, and crumpled into a heap of clothing. I had to find the marble so Grandad would get better, because what does a six-year-old know? about correlation and causation. Despite searching for an hour before school, I couldn't find it. 
and planned to hunt again after. That day dragged on right until afternoon break, when I saw it in the grass, a large milky white marble with bursts of bloodshot. I snatched it and rammed it into my pocket. It had to be Grandad's marble, didn't it? I was confused about where I'd lost it. That's what I told myself. No. And yeah, even when Mrs. Peacock, my class teacher, stopped us from doing addition to ask if anyone had found a marble, I remained convinced he wasn't talking about the one I'd found. And it was still Grandad's marble when she brought Ryan Jepson to the front of the class to describe one much like that in my pocket. I couldn't help my hand from reaching, searching without success for that little edge that indicated its chip. At the end of the school day, I was first out of that classroom. I'd not have left any faster if the damn place was on fire. That marble poked through the fabric of my shorts, looking larger than ever. I rushed to Dad, and instead of speeding me away, he bent down. Sorry, pal. Your granddad's gone. My hand went to my pocket just as Ryan passed. Guilt punched me in the gut, hitting where the news about Grandad had already damaged. I wanted to call out, tell Ryan I had the marble, but the words got stuck, and all these thoughts about Grandad and what he'd think of me took over. I fell into my dad's arms and let the tears fall. At home, I didn't look for Grandad's marble. What was the point? Time passed in a fuzz until night came, and with it, the dream. The marble took the same path, moving faster, bouncing from each step down into the basement, then disappearing. Still, the furnace lit up the space with flickering orange light. Still, it roared its appetite, and had turned to me and moaned the sound of a condemned man. Skin on his face hung loose, and in place of his eyes were two milky white marbles, the pattern inside swirling, bloodshot spreading, thinning faster until smoke drifted out of the socket. In his last moments, my granddad knew me for a thief. But what was it he said? It's not making mistakes that matters, but what we do after. I had to return Ryan's marble. But mum kept me off school, and then it was the weekend. Nightly, the marble led me to the basement, to Grandad, those swirling marble eyes. When I returned to school on the Monday, I had the marble in my pocket, but didn't see Ryan on the playground. When we lined up to go into class, he wasn't there either. And when it was time to do the register, Mrs Peacock didn't even read out his name. I couldn't help but blurt out a question. You know, Mrs. Peacock said, Ryan and his family moved away. Friday was his last day. And that marble in my pocket grew heavier and hotter. I was condemned to suffer Grandad's judgment again that night, and the night after, and every goddamned night of my childhood until my parents, worried sick about the ghoul I'd transformed into, got me on some potent medication to knock me out. A lifetime of dependency because of one little marble. I still make mistakes, but I'll be damned if I don't fix them right away. Because it's there if I fall asleep without something to numb my brain. Last night the booze wasn't enough and the white marble spun in Grandad's eye sockets again. But when I woke with the usual chest freezing terror, I got a bigger shock. I picked up my phone to check the time. A notification. No way. Facebook friend request. Ryan Jepson. Three mutual friends. And it's not like I haven't tried to find it. Hundreds of Ryan Jepson's social media profiles across every platform under the sun. How he comes seeking me. We've all had things that have messed us up. Now I get to give mine back. Hot oh, damn, man! That was great. Oh, there's a lot. There's a lot in there. There is, isn't there? There's Go a on. lot in Go. there. Go for it. Go for it. I mean, I'm, I'm going to read you my favourite note from that whole thing because 
as much as that story was filled with like deep sadness, the line "the metallic bastard" yeah. is one of my favorite things I've ever written down. <laughs> <laughs> had, oh. a, had a sort of a with nail vibe to it that that particular statement. oh definitely definitely i fully fully enjoyed that i the, it was so rich from from word one and then continued to build on it the whole way through it was it was fantastic the i think potentially i also felt like i connected to it quite a lot because um my grand was a carpenter and used to do yeah. things like make those kind of marble runs that you were talking about. Yeah. Um, and uh, and also had like a very strong moral core and stuff. So I don't know how like widely applicable that, that is, but you had me hooked based on the grandfather character and what he did immediately. But I loved the horror in there. The, it was the horror yeah. that was actually the, the, the most sort of... Um, uh, admirable part of it, I think, that even from the very first description of that milky white marble with the you know the bloodshot in it, it is there's a there's a grossness to it mm. that the child almost doesn't recognise in his innocence, um, and and then that continues to grow and that that idea of the marble always rolling towards his grandfather in his dreams is immediately a fantastic idea, well executed. Um, I think yeah. the. Uh... The, the sinister nature of the kind of the built of his own almost like marble based belief system <laughs> yeah. is yeah. it's really nicely done the way it's sort of by the end you know it's translated through into adulthood and you have no doubt yeah this guy this has ruined this man mm. this this actually sort of in the grand scheme meaningless thing and you can you can easily imagine that when he finally opens that friend request, the guy's not going to be like, where's the my matter, fucking mask? It? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's gone. It's, yeah. But, like, it's 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 nothing to the other guy, but it's, yeah, it's completely shaped the your lead's life, and that's, I mean, if nothing else, a brilliant sort of extraction and dissection of of personality and how people are. And how they come to be. Really, yeah, root, really rooted in childhood is the is the point yeah. there, isn't it? Like that. It, the when you 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 find that like deep gear of just smashing forward in time yes. from yeah. when he gets fucked up, <laughs> yeah, to him as a fucked up adult. That was fantastic. That was such a kick. Uh, really, really worked very very well. And the, um, yeah, it's, it's, it. it's, it's almost like a sleep paralysis demon grandfather. Mm -hmm. that he has to drink. Through. Oh yeah, it's just lovely. I say lovely, horrible for him. Yeah, I, lovely in terms of narrative. I was going to say I had I had to do an awful lot of work to get this down um, into the word count. So so the the first draft was from a younger perspective, and it was about um, nineteen hundred words. Um, but then I kind of thought, actually, no, we'll, we'll go older, looking back further, and, mm -hmm. and I'll rewrite it from there. And then it got to uh, two thousand five hundred words, like. That's that's about a thousand, just over a thousand words <laughs> over. So then it had to be uh, chopped up quite severely and pared <laughs> back to to get it to where it was. And you are aware of the you're aware of the rule that it's a lash for every word you are over. So I mean, that <laughs> it's, it's, it's exactly fifteen hundred from... now. It's exactly yeah. fifteen hundred. If that was true, my back would be in absolute tatters by now. Yeah. He'd just be a pair of hands and a face in a jar. Still, still writing and reading them out, but <laughs> it doesn't look good. Yeah, I one of one of my favourite bits in the, in in the whole story came quite near the end, and it's that feeling of being trapped by childhood, by the limitations of childhood, mm. when yeah. his, his this this person moves away, and there's fucking nothing he can do about it. Because that's a problem that goes away almost immediately when you get any kind of independence or money. Yeah. Um, and it, but it, but it's it hamstrings you as a child. Like you, you have to live your life inside these parameters, and you use those parameters to create dramatic tension and horror. And I was it was just daughter. such an elegant sorry. way of doing it. Yeah. So please, please go on. I was, I was talking to my daughter about something like this the other day. She was saying how how big a deal it felt to to leave behind friends um, at the end of primary school when they they were still in the same village. They were going to a different mm, yeah. school the next village over, but it felt like a world apart. And, and she's just come yeah. back from from travelling, where she's leaving people on the other side of the world, and just kind of the perspective <laughs> that's different when you're like 11, or in this case, 6, is just huge. Yeah. Is that 
is that was that a route for this in the story? I, or I think, was, or I think possibly, yeah, kind of sub subconsciously. Um, it, it was a case I was just kind of writing kind of lots of things down when I looked at the prompts, kind of like marble, mm. and kind of uh, I kept coming back. It was this image of the marble eyes spinning that, that kind of uh, was the driver yeah. for it, really. It's them starting to smoke because of the friction that was getting me in the dis when you were talking about it. Yeah, that's some Hellraiser stuff right there. It's yeah, horrible. Eey. We have such um, sights to show you. <laughs> uh, before we move on, I also want to want to cite the uh, the trade for two small marbles and a penguin bar. Oh. That's that. Uh, that one felt real, real. If you get me, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a strange um, system, isn't it? Like, well, yeah, no, that's not worth that. There needs to be something extra too. The penguin bars, the kicker. That's what gets it across the line. There, the it's the sweetener. Yeah. <laughs> Two bits of dry cardboard with some potentially chocolate-based paste in between them. Yeah, they they kind of killed the, uh, the the child barter system now, haven't they? You just can't do any of that at schools anymore. No. It's all done contactless. I, I just I remember being like a kid where we basically had a Pokemon card black market. Yeah. And then all of the schools were like, no, no more of this. You're like, where am I supposed to get my Hubba Bubba from? My mum won't yeah. buy me that, but she will buy me Pokemon cards. <laughs> yeah. I've got some Weedles to shift. <laughs> the real problem there is if you, if that, if uh, the school calls time on that kind of thing when you have invested heavily in stock and then you're <laughs> just stuck with it. Yeah. Which is what happened to me with the uh, Pokemon cards because I, I wasn't interested in playing with them, but. I could use them to get things I did want, as you were just talking about. So <laughs> I ended up with a fuckload of Pokemon cards that I didn't give a shit about. <laughs> and I had to learn the game after the fact. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, oh you, you, brought it, you brought it all back. You've unzipped me. <laughs> oh, you've unzipped me. <laughs> right, okay. I think that was an absolutely delightful story, like Thank beautifully you. told and really intricately but elegantly written. So, really appreciate that. Thanks, yes. thanks for telling Thank us you. it. Third and final story. Are you ready for us, Nico? Suppose I better be. Let's do it. Marble. When it was only the paintings, it did not really seem so bad. Now, on reflection, it was a wonderful time. It had started with some nondescript painting of a horse in an unsuspecting grandmother's house in Swansea. It had begun the whole thing. It was, according to the local news at the time, whinnying up a storm. It had become a hot piece of information. People had begun flocking to Swansea, which in truth lacked the infrastructure of or any sort of en masse arrival. They wanted to see the painting that had come to life. The next was a portrait of some French duke. It was in a dusty corner of a museum. He began calling in panicked and rather old-fashioned French for someone to help him. By the time they'd found a linguist who could get what he was saying in order, Half a dozen other paintings had begun calling out too. Portraits, mostly. With little dogs yapping in the laps of mid-century ladies that lunched, while their owners cooed affectionately. Popes began giving sermons in various states of Latin, and cardinals stretching back hundreds of years whispered conspiratorially in their frames. It started becoming apparent only those who had been alive were able to communicate from beyond the frame. Great hordes of people had gathered under paintings of cherubim and seraphim, awaiting some kind of divine awakening. They'd had to install a 24-hour guard system at the Last Supper. Of course, when it hadn't moved an inch, the church had declared some nonsense about demons and how we should not trust the living artworks. The historians, on the other hand, were making as much use of it as they could, asking the figures what their time had been like. There was a headline that every paper must have printed a dozen times, Art Imitates Life. The first reporter who penned it must have been very proud of himself. Of course, even they would have been sick of it by the time the thing started to change. 
It was around two months after the first painting had begun to wake that a broken half-head carved from grey stone began to scream on its pedestal. Slowly but surely, figures of bronze and marble began to stir. These were something more than the paintings, which became quickly apparent. They stepped down from their pedestals and began to walk. They were perfect, in a way, all carved to be incredible specimens, beautiful, tall, gleaming. People had thought it amusing when so many of them gathered and began asking for their genitals back. <laughs> the statue folk were not impressed when historians explained they'd been knocked off by the church in the name of decency. When the statues had asked where this church was based, they'd been told offhand. The exchange of information was given freely. Had we not shared already with the living paintings, what could possibly come of it? So when statues began to walk across the ocean floor, breathless and tireless, and massed in Rome, the first concept that perhaps there was a problem emerged. There were countless living effigies of emperors and great warriors. Unlike the fops and dandies living in portrait form, these men were not willing to take it laying down. The Vatican was the first country they took. It's a small place, but it still counted. We hadn't really considered what it meant before then, the whole art imitates life thing. That had been a, a joke, a play on words. But was this imitation? How do we handle this? These creatures have no legal rights, save the protections they had been afforded as heritage pieces. So what do we do now? The world leaders would have to gather to discuss it. No G summit, no, they, they all must attend which of course started the petty bickering over who would host such a thing. Long dormant rivalries and ancient hatreds warred out with the need for defense. It was only the Vatican, many of them said, barely even a real country. Catholicism has had its day. The United States of America insisted they could not leave their soil for this matter. Several Middle Eastern and Asian nations rebuked their invitation. In the face of failed compromise, the living carved continued their sweep. Some of our own fell in with them. A new religion was birthed, cult-like in the wake of their tread. They couldn't be blamed for it. The statues gave orders, but only to each other. They answered questions only when they felt like it. But their unstoppable march dragged with it the weak, the hungry, the abandoned. So many who felt the world had forgotten about them were willing to watch it burn and even help to ignite it. It took less than a year for mainland Europe to have its throat slit by the carved. Well-serving human thralls were given positions of rule over conquered cities, and country borders began to vanish. The Marble Dynasty was established. I had lived for most of my life in Berlin, but now I am part of the great marching column that seeks to spread across all corners of the world. I was taken because I had attended art school. When the concept was explained to them, the statues seemed to think it was a grand idea. The mines were opened, and human lives spent in droves to unearth minerals. Even now a great slab of marble is making its way to me, so that I may carve a statue for the first time in my life. It is to be based on the strongest man that they could find, some athlete I had never heard of. We are not permitted to talk a great deal in the column, but I could tell many of us are artists. It seems silly, but you can always tell the type. Had the circumstances been different, perhaps I would have found this to be a pleasant gathering. They are not. 
I've counted at least 400 out there, not sent to the mines. I feel we are about to carve ourselves out of necessity. I have no doubt that some of them will be carving artists instead of warriors from stone. And then they won't need us at all. Loved it. The concept. So simple, yet wonderfully executed. It's, uh... It, yeah, it's a, it's a really weird one, but it doesn't feel, like, particularly new, for lack of a better term, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I did write down towards the end, like, uh, uh, like modern fears over AI. Yes. Plus, plus Night at the Museum. <laughs> plus Night at the Museum, I like that. Um, but that's quite reductive, I think, because you actually did it far better in the story when you said art imitates life and you, you were making that, making that joke. But yeah. it, this is a, a really interesting lateral interpretation of that, which is it's executed very, very well. The, I love the idea of only people that actually lived come back. Yeah. That was really exciting. And the way that you just absolutely savaged the last supper with that was fantastic. <laughs> Um, and then to compound that with these fucking golems marching on the Vatican to get their dicks back is, it was good. I mean, I, I think maybe like a year or two years ago, your story might have ended there. Yeah. Like that might have been the the crescendo. That might have been, you know, you know the, the punchline sort of thing. Yeah, I get you. Um, but it wasn't. And it, it leads you to this really interesting like you know ai printing themselves like almost like matrix like situation except with statuary yeah, yeah. um really interesting interpretation of the prompt oh just really liked it and loads of lovely lovely turns of phrase you know cardinals whispering conspiratorially is just wonderful um it's got a good mouthfeel that one it's it? a yeah. great mouthfeel on that one yeah <laughs> uh, yeah i loved it too oh that's great um just in terms of escalation just from the first line, when it was only the paintings, it did not seem so bad. That tells you right from the start that things are going to get a lot more serious. Um, obviously, knowing the yeah. prompt was marble, we had the idea of where that was going. <laughs> um, but, but then I was always thinking, well, where do we go from here? How much further is this going to go? And it, it did so many great things. Just the idea of them as... Um, becoming worshipped almost like um the word cult w w was mentioned there referring to them as yeah. the carved and the marble dynasty and, and the column that it was yeah it felt like this this had really escalated to, to such an extent um that then we start talking about kind of yeah humanity no longer being required once they can uh of the artist but yeah fabulous think I, 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 there was a lot when I was writing it I was thinking about some time I spent in Rome last year and there's just countless statues of like great generals and war heroes and if, if you just had if you got all of the statues of Julius Caesar <laughs> and you put them together it'd be like, like what like a megazord yeah like what what can it not achieve <laughs> <laughs> mega kaiser what you can um... do shoot a man made of brass like <laughs> okay yeah, yeah, no, it, it's you. You captured this idea of these like uh, the terrifying aspect of a golem is this unliving flesh, so it's very difficult to damage it and stop yeah. it um, in in a sort of military way. And yeah, I really, really enjoyed like where that idea started, how it grew, and where it went to. It was, it was that was fully, fully well rounded and and really, really interesting as a as a concept and. I think you need some plaudits for that one. That was very good. Thank you. I enjoyed that I, a lot. I, I, that was a really good trio of stories. Yeah. Sometimes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that we didn't do a good job here, but also I think prompts matter. Yes. Yeah. And I still, after all, this, after all this time, still haven't quite pinned down what makes a good prompt. And. I agree. Um, this is this is one of them. I think it felt like very fertile ground for us all to have gone in extremely different directions with it. Yeah. Um, and nothing felt too like over 
trodden in in terms of ground. Like um, there were still nice links between them, you know, with myself and and uh, Ben's um, story sort of focusing on this like younger point yeah. of view, and even um, your uh, y- your story sort of takes place at the start in sort of Swansea. So I was doing a bit of a Welsh accent, yeah, stuff like that. Like there were links, but yeah. It was yeah, really yeah. I really enjoyed and really enjoyed both of yours. So thank you, thank you both. A lovely trio. Great to be part well, of it. What a so, pleasure always. It's definitely important at this point that we should point out that you can buy Benjamin Langley's books. You can use your money to purchase them and then read them and then tell him what you think of them. Not can should I should yes should. thank you should <laughs> you must you must must do this. Um, so you can. Uh, head to benjaminlangley.co.uk for links and updates. Um, and also he is B underscore J underscore Langley at uh, Twitter. Is there anywhere else that they should definitely... Instagram, Benjamin Langley, no. writer. Um, mostly pictures of the books I'm either writing or reading. So it's a, it's quite a nice medium in that way. You can kind of talk about what I'm reading there. So, so that's lovely. Um have a Facebook page as well, which um, again I think is Benjamin Langley Writer. Uh, so that's yeah, but the, the website is more up to date than it was previously. So there's plenty of information on there, links to where you can get those books. Fantastic. Well, you join us on the next one for some questions, a bit of an interview, and we'll talk some more about Guy Fawkes' Demon Hunter, the trilogy. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Tiny Bookcase. Remember to subscribe, otherwise you're going to miss out on the future fun. Also, tell a friend. If you like this episode, link them to it. We'd be tremendously grateful. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, Facebook at The Tiny Bookcase, and Instagram at Bookcase Tiny for updates. Speaking of supporting the podcast, well, magic can only take one so far. The Tiny Bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons. Those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year. Let's cast a spell for them, shall we? For uh, Magnificent Beardery, let's cast the Chinicus Folliculale spell on Gary Laird. For Rich Ginger Tones on the scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for general fabulousness, why not the Ulala la la Al's Your Mother spell on Matthew McLaren? How do you come up with that shit, man?